Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today for our ALS Webinar Wednesday series. My name is Alejandra Herrera and I'm the Marketing Coordinator for ALS North America. I will be facilitating the webinar today. If you're having technical issues with our webinar platform or you have any questions, please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen. You can also select the hand icon to notify me of your status so I can assist you. All questions regarding the webinar material will be answered at the end of this presentation. Our presenter today is David Gordonbanek. David is the National Quality Manager for ALS Environmental in Canada. He graduated from the University of Manitoba with a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry. David has been with ALS in various capacities since 2011. In his current position, David is responsible for leading the development and implementation of the ALS Canada National Quality System. Today, David will be discussing quality control practices, building quality into every test result. David, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you. So hello, everyone. Um, just a little bit more about myself. Uh, as Alejandra has said, my name is David Gertabanyak, and I am the National Play Manager for ALS Environmental in Canada. And I myself work out of our Winnipeg location. Uh, I have been with the company for a little over 11 years, and my analytical background is uh, mostly in toxicology, microbiology, as well as industrial hygiene testing. Uh, so yes, as she mentioned, today we're going to be discussing quality control practices. And we're going to be um, looking at these systems and uh, seeing how uh, these get propagated through to provide real benefits to both our clients and our laboratories. So just as an overview, we're going to be discussing uh, what quality control actually is. Um, we'll quickly talk about a few common types of quality control samples. And then we'll also dive deeper into some different uses of uh, quality control sample results. So uh, first of all, what is QAQC? Uh, QAQC, it's a term that we've all heard, uh, but there are really two, they are two different concepts. So QA or quality assurance is referring to the systems that we have in place that ensure consistent quality is delivered. Uh, these are the actual activities and procedures that are implemented in the laboratories. And this is what's known as a quality management system. At ALS Canada, uh, we have a nationally harmonized quality system. So there are many benefits to that, uh, but one of the best things is that this ensures that the systems in place in one location are the exact same that are in place in a different location. Uh, now quality control is the operational practices that are performed to fulfill the quality requir requirements defined by our quality system. So what this is, is really the analysis of quality control or QC samples uh, that have known concentrations. So a theme of this is going to be looking at uh, QAQC and how it's essential for generating reliable results. So generally speaking, there are two major types of quality controls that are implemented in the laboratories. Uh, the first is instrument QC. So these are analysis of QC samples at the instrument level uh, that show that there's control over the instrument. So there are prerequisite checks that are done prior to analyzing client samples. Next are the method QC samples. So these are samples that show control over the entire process. Uh, this is all steps of the method, including both preparation activities as well as the actual analysis. So there are some common types of QC. Uh, for instrument QC, we have uh, the initial calibration. And so this is what establishes the relationship between a reference standard and the measuring instrument. Uh, so at ALS Canada, we are evaluating each point on the calibration curve to ensure that it is suitable. Instrument blanks are blank samples that are run to check for instrument background levels. Uh, the calibration verification standard, or CVS, uh, this is a second source check on the calibration. Um, using a second source is important because it ensures that there's no self-referencing. So when we're checking the calibration curve, we're using a different material to make sure that it's appropriate. And this is uh, just checking to make sure that the stability and accuracy of the calibration standards are okay. 
And then uh, the continuing calibration verifications or CCVs. These are just ongoing time-based calibration checks that are monitoring the curve for calibration drift. Now for method QC, um, these are going to be the ones that uh, most of you are probably more familiar with of these as these would be reported um, with your results. So method blanks, this is a clean or a blank control sample that goes through all the steps that applies to all samples. Uh, the point of this is it's supposed to be detecting for contamination during sample preparation or analysis, and it's also checking for false positives within a batch. A laboratory control sample, or an LCS, uh, these are commonly referred to as uh, spikes as well. This is a clean matrix. For example, it could be deionized water, clean sand, or just the different reagents used throughout a method. Uh, so this clean matrix is spiked with test analytes. Uh, this is our core method performance indicator, and it's making sure that um, it <laughs> that our, our method is performing as expected. It doesn't evaluate effects of complex sample matrices, though, as it is a clean matrix. Uh, so what we're looking for are percent recoveries here, and we're um, measuring it to verify successful performance of the batch of samples. Um, as that is a clean matrix, we also are verifying more complex matrix matrices, and that's where reference materials and matrix spikes come in. So a reference material is going to be something with a well-established analyte concentration, and we as well are going to be evaluating the percent recoveries to make sure there's um, successful performance for the test uh, for the batch. And then matrix spikes are individual client samples. A different aliquot is spiked with test analytes. And this uh, assesses recovery and method performance for an individual client sample. Um, it evaluates matrix effects and interferences for that specific uh, sample. Surrogates are compounds with similar properties to the test analytes that we're looking for. Um, they're added to each sample prior to analysis. And again, we're looking for percent recovery there to make sure that there's successful performance of the test for each sample. And surrogates are most commonly used in organics testing. And then duplicates are two replicate analysis of the same client sample. Uh, what it's doing is measuring variance of a test method on a given client sample. Uh, what's important to remember though is that every test method is unique. Uh, these are just common QC types, but the appropriate QC needs to be determined um, for each test. And that normally happens during our initial method validation stage. So there's different places we can go to determine what appropriate QC types are. For example, we can use reference methods or um, just things that are standard for a particular field of testing, as well as we can use our previous experience in other tests. We are also going to be adding additional checks where experience indicates that a specific test in a sample handling or analytical process requires closer observation. So each test method is evaluated and appropriate QC is determined. So now I want to talk about uh, some of the different um, uses of QC. Um, each of these topics could warrant an entire presentation on themselves, but I do just want to touch a little bit on each of these. So uh, the QC samples we described are used for multiple purposes. Uh, including batch level quality control, method validation, uh, detection limit establishment, long-term performance assessments, including uh, looking at bias and precision, as well as revalidation and constant improvement, calculating measurement uncertainty, and trend identifications in the, our method performance. So the first and probably most well-known use of QC is how it applies to batches of samples. So in the lab, with each batch of samples, um, we're going to be running QC samples to evaluate their results and compare it to control limits. Uh, so these criteria are called uh, data quality objectives, or DQOs. And meeting these shows that re results are reliable. These DQOs are method specific uh, for the expected outcome of our QC samples that do have known values. For example, blanks are expected to be blank. Uh, duplicate duplicates, we're comparing the recovery of the replicate samples, so these should be comparable within our precision criteria. Spike samples, so our LCSs, matrix 
spikes, reference materials, and surrogates, we're looking at the recoveries of these and evaluate those and they should be within our accuracy criteria. Again, meeting the criteria shows control over the process uh, for the associated batch of samples. And when I'm talking about a batch of samples, I'm generally referring to a group of 20 samples. So QC samples are run with a batch. And so each 20 samples, there will be also one blank run, one duplicate run, uh, one LCS, um, a matrix spike or a reference material. Uh, surrogates are a little different in, in that they are normally put into every single sample and QC sample. So those are added to every, every sample. Um, now, meeting the criteria shows that everything is okay. However, what happens if there are exceedances? Uh, well, there are a few common causes of DQO exceedances. Uh, they can be things like sample matrix effects or chemical interferences, and those things can impact recovery. Uh, Non-homogeneity of, of samples, uh, that can impact precision, or even things like equipment failures, and that will impact recovery and turnaround times. Um, what's important is that if there is an exceedance, there needs to be an investigation done. So the actions that need to be done is we need to investigate the situation and fix the problem and then reanalyze the samples if it's possible. When it's not possible, the lab can report the results, but they need to be qualified and commented on um, that describe the potential impact. So where there is a potential impact, that would be communicated. So QC evaluation is the main defense against inappropriate data being reported, and it is key in ensuring quality results. Another use uh, for QC is validating our methods. So method validation is a huge topic, uh, but in general terms, this is the process of how labs show that they're able to perform methods properly. Uh, as I described before, this is also the point where appropriate QC types are chosen. So in order to show control over method, labs are going to be analyzing different sets of QC samples. Uh, generally, this comes in the form of an analyzing sets of method blanks, uh, laboratory control samples spiked at different concentrations, uh, matrix spikes analyzed to ensure that the expected matrices that we receive don't have any negative effects. Uh, we're also going to be evaluating things like uh, instrument carryover to ensure that there's control over that process as well, analyzing reference materials or proficiency testing samples. So all of these are, are run and evaluated, and then we compare them to our validation objectives that are established at the beginning of the process. And then using these QC results, uh, we're establishing the fitness for use for a method. So QC results are also used to determine detection limits or MDLs. So ALS protocols for DLs, uh, they are conservative by industry standards. Um, we recognize that false positives can be damaging to our clients. So our overall objective is to ensure that virtually all detected results are real and that our frequency of false positives is near zero. So QC samples, as I said, used to establish detection limits. Uh, the MDL is a statistically derived detection limit. Now, the US EPA, they define this as the minimum concentration of a substance that can be measured and reported with 99% confidence that the measured concentration is distinguishable from a method blank result. Um, essentially that a positive sample is positive. So when detected above, uh, when a result is detected above the detection limit, there's a less than a 1% chance that the measurement is a false positive. So, Limits of reporting are related to our detection limits. So the LOR is the detection limit that ALS reports to clients for a given result. Uh, and this is established based on client needs, uh, different criteria, and based directly off of uh, the detection limit. In all cases, the LORs that are reported to clients are greater than the detection limit. Where possible, we do like to set the LORs at twice the detection limit just for added protection against false positives. But how do we actually establish our limits of reporting? Well, as I said, the detection limit is calculated from our long-term QC data. So 
Uh, this is our equation here. Uh, the important variables that uh, we're going to be are S0 as well as the mean blank here. So S0 is the standard deviation at low concentrations. And the mean blank is just going to be the average of our blank results. The standard deviation at low concentration is taken from the largest of either one of these three things. So it's going to be the standard deviation of our historical method blanks, low level duplicates, or low level spike samples. Uh, we take the largest uh, from one of these as that is the most conservative approach. And then we're also going to take into account any applicable criteria or guidelines. And so these can be client requirements or industry standards or regulations. We then use this information to establish our LORs, which again are at least our MDL, but preferably twice our MDL. So another use for QC samples is going to be the evaluation of long-term performance of our methods. So since labs can analyze thousands or multiple thousands of QC samples per year, uh, we can look at the long-term data and evaluate the methods that are in use. So generally, uh, this takes the form of collecting QC results over a defined period. Uh, for example, this can be a year, that could be two years, we could use all the data um, that has been run by that method. It, it depends on the situation, but generally we'll use one year. Uh, we would then look at the results and then st to statistically analyze them and determine measures of precision and bias. We also can confirm our detection limits and calculate our detection limits to ensure that they're still appropriate. Uh, this evaluation is compared to different objectives and we confirm that the methods are still fit for use. So doing this periodically does provide a means for constant improvement and it helps with oversight of the performance of the methods. Measurement uncertainty is also an important part of uh, methods and it is also derived from our QC results. So measurement uncertainty itself is a parameter associated with the results of a measurement that characterizes the dispersion of the values that can be reasonably attributed to the measurement to what's being measured. So this is really the plus or minus range around a result. Uh, generally on a report, if you're requesting MU information, this is gonna be appearing beside the results as that plus minus range. Um, understanding the measurement uncertainty is important for keeping control over a method and understanding it is also a requirement of accredited labs under ISO 17025, so it is very important. Now, our equation for our expanded 95% uh, uncertainty is as shown here. So what I'd like to draw your attention to is going to be three variables. Um, this S0, theta, and the mean blank long term. So we have just talked about uh, standard deviation, uh, low concentrations, as well as the mean blank. Uh, but theta is, is uh, something new. So theta is going to be the combined relative standard uncertainty, uh, which combines high concentration uncertainties from things like our high level spikes and high level duplicates. Um, our calculation takes into account both low level and high level uncertainties and calculates this uncertainty based on the concentration of a result C. So each result that we generate has an associated measurement uncertainty, and we use these constants to relate measurement uncertainty to a result. And again, we are using historical QC data to derive this. And um, yeah, this is a very big topic, but that was just a very quick overview of measurement uncertainty. Now, trend identification is sort of the last thing that I wanted to, to mention. So as I've just talked about, historical QC data is important. Um, one thing that is done in our labs is utilizing control charts. So they're a very useful tool that allows us to visualize method performance. So QC results are tracked and uploaded to control charts, and these charts are monitored. So this is just an example of a control chart. Uh, you can see here that there's uh, these green points and these are the actual historical results of our QC samples. Uh, then we have the outermost red lines. Those are our control limits. 
Uh, also, there are data quality objectives. And then the inner lines are going to be the different standard deviation levels. So this is a pretty normal example. We can see that uh, the points are generally randomly distributed and there's really no notable trends. Um, however, charts can be used to monitor for trends. So for example, um, imagine a chart something like this. So hypothetically, uh, this chart does show something interesting. Uh, we can see that the, the QC results were running pretty normally, but then there was a sudden change recently. So taken at face value, each of the low points are within our control limit. So there should be no problem, right? Well, no. Um, tracking and monitoring these charts are pointing towards there being some potential issue. Um, and it could be a potential issue now or something in the future. So there might be many reasons for uh, something like this appearing. It could be things like instrument degradation or issues with supplies or maybe even performance of an individual analyst. It could be really anything. But tracking, control, tracking our QC results in control charts allows us to identify the trend and investigate and fix the issue. So this is one type of trend. Another example would be something like this. Um, so again, at face value, each point is within the control limits. But because we're tracking and monitoring these control charts, we can observe that there has been some sort of change. And this gives us an opportunity to improve our process. So the main point here is that QC results give us the ability to monitor method performance and provide a mechanism for identifying potential issues so we can improve our processes. So key takeaways here is that quality control analysis is a key laboratory function. It ensures that batch results are fit for purpose. It's used to verify test methods that are in use, and it's key in establishing LORs. As well, we use it to characterize measurement uncertainty and indicates where improvements can be made. And using these systems, this is how quality control can build quality into every result. So uh, thank you for your attention. That was just a quick overview of some of our QC practices. Uh, this is my contact information, so it should also be in the webinar info. So if you would like, you can follow up with me uh, and feel free to do so. Also, um, if you need any additional information or want general information, feel free to contact your local ALS laboratory or visit our ALS website at alsglobal.com. There are a lot of good resources and information there. So um, that is what I have today. So I'll pass it back off to Alejandra. Thank you, David, for your presentation and for the great content. Um, before we begin the Q&A, I would like to ask everyone to take our survey. You can find the link in the chat section. I will give two minutes. We will open the forum for questions now. Please write out your question using the Q&A function in the toolbar at the bottom of this webinar. 
I will give everyone a few moments to type in your questions. In the meantime, I will review some brief notes. This webinar presentation has been recorded. All participants of this webinar will receive a follow-up email once the recording is available to view. We also post our webinars on our ALS global website and, our, and on our ALS YouTube channel. Also, please follow our company page on LinkedIn as we post announcements and registration links to future webinars and other resources. Okay, do we have any questions? David, you talked about daily application of data quality objectives for ensuring samples are acceptable. Where do these data quality objectives come from? Sure. So, yeah, um, data quality objectives, DQOs, um, these are very important. Uh, the performance, these are the performance requirements for all of our QC. So that includes instrument QC as well as method QC. Um, the whole point of it is to protect customers and regulatory interests. So a lot of there could be lots of sources for, for DQOs, and it depends on a few things. Um, so there might be things like uh, regulatory regulatory specifications or non-regulatory standard practices, um, contractual obligations or crediting body specifications. So lots of things go into this. Um, and we use lots of sources. So I guess if there are regulatory specifications, um, those agencies usually have some outlines for what the data quality objectives should be. Uh, for example, Ontario Ministry of the Environment or the BC Ministry of the Environment. Um, there could be national guidance. Uh, one of the largest ones is going to be the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment, so CCME. They have um, published data quality objectives that should be able to be met. Um, for customer specifications, a lot of customers could uh, need to follow requirements from the U.S. Department of Defense, and they have outlined different data quality objectives that should be met, as well as um, reference, uh, reference methods. They could be prescriptive in nature. So, for example, things like uh, Canada-wide hydrocarbon tier one method, they, you have to follow that method word for word, so they will have they all have objectives listed there. Um, barring any of those types of things, uh, it could also come from just historical performance of the method. Um, as well, there could be a combination of these things that apply. And in that case, we would sort of use the most restrictive objectives available to us. And again, the whole point of that is to just uh, protect uh, customer and agency requirements. So. Yeah, that's generally where they come from. Thank you. Someone's asking, when we are reporting non-detect values, should we report the ND at the lower or LR, LOR or at the MDL? So that's an interesting question. So the way we norm we would handle that is that our LOR is what we are reporting to the clients. So this is what level they need to, to, to meet. So when we're reporting non-detects, we would report less than our LOR. Uh, as I said before, our LORs are normally, they're, they're normally higher than our MDL, um, but using LORs, you should, you should be able to, um, you have your MDL calculated and you should be able to, um, to know what an appropriate LOR is. Um, so when you're reporting, it, it's right in the name, the limit of reporting. That is what we use to report um, our non-detects. Jeff would like to know, if percentage recoveries are consistently low, is it reasonable to consider this is in the interpretation of results. For example, if a result is right on a regulatory standard and percentage recovery was low, reasonable to assume the result exceeds the standard or vice versa? 
So that would, it depends on the situation. Um, the data quality objectives are outlined to say that when there is QC results within the criteria, then it is acceptable. Um, if you're comparing your results to a regulatory standard, um, there is something called the decision rule. And that is how you apply measurement uncertainty when taking a result and comparing it to a, um, a guideline. So that needs to be discussed between the lab and the client, and you need to determine how measurement uncertainty will be applied. Generally, in most cases, regulations do not want measurement uncertainty applied. So that would include things like uh, a negative bias. Um, so it, it really depends on the situation. Um, I would say that if there are um, biases or, or low recoveries seen, um, the best thing to do would be contact the laboratory and work with the laboratory to um, try and figure out what this means for your results or what this, um, if there are any potential impacts. Because as I was saying, if there is anything wrong with the client samples, we need to be qualifying the data and adding comments where um, data quality is in question. Um, and the best way to do this, if you are concerned about results, is contacting your laboratory and working with the laboratory to, um, to figure out what's going on. I think that's all the questions that we have for today. All right. Uh, well, again, thanks everyone for, for the time. Again, feel free to reach out to me if you do have any questions that you can think of after. Um, I believe my contact information should be with the information in the, um, the webinar link. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for your time, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, David. And thank you everyone for attending our webinar and enjoy the rest of your week.